next meeting is being recorded. Okay, if you're ready to go, uh, we ask everybody to mute yourselves at this point. Uh, so we uh, can get started. And man, uh, it's been like a week and a forever that we have we we have seen our friends here on a Zoom rock room like three weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, Brittany, I sure missed the uh, the Zoom rock room people, didn't you? Yes, I did. I don't. I don't really like the extra week in between. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you know, I think I I I think you I think you and I had a good time there uh, in, in in the off time between the Zoom rooms. We we had two two programs at the Sweet Arrow Lake on the hottest day of the year so far. You put me through the ringers. Uh, I barely got home, eating my ice cream and drinking my soda. That got me that got me home there. So anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, we had a good time at Sweet Arrow Lake. Uh, it was ex ex extraordinarily hot. The other Saturday, but uh, he made it through. Anyway, um, let's get started with our introduction here. Oh, Jerry, before we get started, you should tell them about what happened to your driver's license recently. Oh no, I don't. I don't think. I don't think I should tell, tell that. Really oh should. come on, it's funny. <laughs> oh my, yes, ma'am. I I listened to your orders. Uh, Okay, so two weeks ago, I was a, I was a nervous wreck because we had put together a retirement service for my wife. She she retired from ministry a week and a half ago after thirty nine years, and I put together a special service for her for the last two months. We planned this thing, and uh, two weeks ago, I was a nervous wreck because I knew what was coming. And I was excited, and so the story goes as briefly as I can make it. Um, the Tuesday before that service. I put my Messiah University parking pass and ID card, I thought, in the mail uh, to send back to Messiah, as I have to do after every year. And I put that in our mailbox at 9 o'clock. And at 2 o'clock, I go get ready to get, go do a project. And uh, I look in my wallet. My driver's license is missing. And I look in my little box where I keep uh, things I get. And, uh, my Messiah ID card is in that little container where I thought I mailed it back. So I actually, what I found out I did is mail, mail my license, driver's license back with my, with my permit. So like a dog chasing the postmaster, that's what I did around the, the neighborhood. And uh, we found, uh, I found the, uh, the postmaster who used to be our mail lady who no longer is doing our route and uh, told her what happened. She said, when I get back to the office, post office, I'll, I'll look for it. And she meantime told me where to go find the, the uh, guy that delivers our mail and never found him. We said, we actually sat in the uh, housing development for an hour because the flags were still up on the, on the uh, mailboxes. And he never showed up. And uh, luckily, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, the post office called me and said they have my letter. So I went and retrieved my driver's license. So don't ever mail your driver's license to anybody. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I lucked out and uh, I got it back and everything's all fine. So, Brittany, th thanks for letting me uh, look like a real idiot. I appreciate it. <laughs> Appreciate that. Okay, so, all right, let's go on with our intro here. So the Zoom Rock Room, always sponsored by their architect in Lake Havasu City. And uh, new people tonight, I'm expecting a couple of new people in here tonight uh, that have asked for invitations. Uh, we always like to have you every now and then drop their architect at yahoo.com an email saying thank you for supporting and actually making the Zoom Rock Room 
possible. Go ahead, Brittany. All righty. So at the Institute on June 25th, they're going to have a blooming walk to rhododendrons. And you could also join their SOAR bird watching group on the first and third Saturdays of each month. The locations vary, and this is free and everyone's welcome. You can find that information at their website, natureandcultureinstitute.org. And our buddy, Mr. Andrew Epic, better known as Dirtman, is our official videographer and does these tremendous uh, uh, Dirtman reports. And actually tonight he does have he does have one in uh, in uh, land here, and I actually have to make him a host here. We finally figured out the video issue, everyone. You're going to see this in perfect quality now. Hopefully, <laughs> after six months of promising that. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Andrew. We've heard that before. No, we figured it out. I have to be host. I actually have to be the host to be able to play in perfect quality. If I'm not the host, it doesn't work. So nice. Jerry and I jumped on early today just to get that working. There you go. All right. So I was hoping Joe and Scott would be here tonight with me, but they're not. Uh, who knows what they're uh, – they might still be pulling miners out of the mine at this point of the night. Uh, so – I went back to Mohawk Valley Mineral Mining to film part two because in part one, I never answered the question, what makes a Herkimer diamond different than a regular quartz crystal? So I had to go finish that. Um, and I think um, you all should enjoy this quite a lot. Uh, this was uh, last weekend. Um, sorry, Memorial Day weekend. Um, so. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, there were a lot of miners there. Everything was coming out of the ground. It was an amazing time to film. So here it comes. Everyone, please enjoy. Please hold. Hmm. Well, this worked earlier. It's not letting me optimize the video clip, so it might stutter again. I'm sorry. We'll figure this out one day. Here we go. Please enjoy. I'm Joe from the Elusive Herkimer Diamond. And I'm Dermman, here with another special report. Live here at Mohawk Valley Mineral Mining, where it's all happening every day. We've got a lot of people here mining. Let's check out the action. I'm here with Dory and she's been mining in this massive hole over here and look what she's got. One is a double and this other is bigger than both of the double and that is awesome. Makes the whole day worth it. Oh yeah. I'm here with Luke. He's been digging way down in this hole. It's right below me. He hit a nice faceted crystal. He's about to pull it out. Yeah, nice and gentle. Don't want to rock it. Just want to pull it straight out. Oh yeah. So, oh whoa. There it is. Oh, nice one. The Mohawk Monsters. That's you want it. a monster, you come to Mohawk. You don't go to yeah. any other mine. That is what we call them. They're the Mohawk Monsters. Luke, congratulations. Man. Thank you. And look what Peanut found. Peanut was digging around <laughs> and somehow managed to just push this out of the dirt. Look at Peanut's little uh, helmet there. Lifetime member with the hard hat. Oh, yeah, but look what Peanut found. Now, nah. Vicky's been digging real hard and she's been working and she dug that big old hole there and she found that. Look at that, that is a mohawk monster. To coin the phrase, that is it right there. Three crystals are growing together. One there, one here, and then the massive one there. Awesome job, Thank awesome you. job, great job, Vicki. <laughs> I'm here with Mama Rockhound, and she just came over to this new spot today, and within two inches of hitting the surface, she hit this. Holy crap. Runs in the blood, I need one now. <laughs> so, I settle in for a long day of breaking rock with Joe, Herkimer Harry, and Rich. It wants to. It's cracking right along here. I know, it's I've got a good right crack here. going. Put that one in there. 
Y'all are like now pounding on the, the crack that I started. <laughs> Let it rip. But with this legendary crew, it isn't long before we hit the soup bowl pocket. I'm just got my hand here. Ah! Holy crap! Oh yeah! Holy crap! Diamond! Yeah. 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 Ooh, we did it! We found it! All right! Oh my God! Look at the oh one back God. there. Yep. Oh my God! Loose too. Loose. Loaded ah. with perfect water clears. Golden and oh, one so beautiful Palmer. Ooh, look at that! Look at that! It's got oh, a friend. Wow. Beautiful. Oh my God! This Absolutely amazing. amazing. Got more back in there, it's like dude. A birthday candle. All right, Joe, where's mine? I'm here with Herkimer Harry. He just pulled out that amazing pocket down there and those amazing crystals. So, in your opinion, what makes a Herkimer diamond different than normal quartz crystals? Well, for one thing, it's the clarity. And then the uh, the way they're shaped, the way that they're like cut, like diamonds, when, when you find some of them. And then the the hardness of them compared to the, the regular quartz. So they're harder than regular quartz? Yes, they are. Well, let's go test that out. What better way to test the hardness of a Herc than firing it out of a cannon? Oh, there it is. Oh, look how perfect. It survived. <laughs> and it survived. Look at that. The Herc is perfect. It had a key mark in it before I put it in there, but it is good to go. Circus acts aside, a scratch test is the proper way to test hardness. A Herkimer diamond with a hardness of 7.5 should scratch a quartz crystal with a hardness of 7, which it does proving the Herc is actually harder. But it's not just hardness, it's clarity too. Side by side, there's no doubt, Hercs are on a whole different level of quality. I'm here with Dave and Shaw. Dave pointed to me at a good spot where he thought there might be one, so I said, Mom, go over there. She found it. So, Dave, what makes a Herkimer so special? Herkimer's done when you pull it out of the ground. All you do is just pick them up and bask in their glory. <laughs> You're that good? Like, seriously, it's weird to say it that way. The other thing is, it is double terminated. So it's free floating and it's, it's, it has that ability to have the perfectness without having to go through a cutting shop or a lab, you know? Yep. It's just done. Nature Straight out of the ground. Work. Yeah. Or out of the rock. Yeah. Sean, you, what, to you, what makes it so special? Um, I think it's so special when the water clears come straight out of the dirt. I mean, they're already like seen. Basically, you can see right through them. Yep. Can't find that with most other things. Nope. They're so perfect already. Yep. I'm now over here with Alex, and he's the geology guy here around here. So, what makes a herc so special? So these hercs are special because they have exceptional clarity. Uh, during formation, there was a large presence of hydrocarbons, which attributed to their increased clarity more than those of other quartz varieties. Uh, there was also a unique set of environmental factors and geological occurrences that are the reason we find these circumer diamonds here today. So what does it all boil down to? It boils down to the fact that it's the history, the clarity, the quality of these Herkimer diamonds that make them so much different than your typical quartz crystal. Oh yes. yeah. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, it was oh, bigger yes. than it was in the hole. <laughs> Hold the light on it, JD. Ooh, oh, wow! Oh my God! Yowza, yowza, yowza! That's Take incredible. Off here. And I'm gonna go back in there and I'm gonna look some more because I felt more stuff. It might have just been a rock, but when I was scratching beneath this, I felt oh something. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Holy Mac, are you all right, Mac? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, let me see. That's the second one? That's the second one. Yeah. 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 This is wonderful. I had spent two days trying to get to these things. Finally, it opened up. That's number one, and that's number two. And these will probably Almost go back like together. You're going to need tape or something, Matt. You know that's not going to stay together. It's going to be something like this. So yeah. you just, after you clean that out, you'll see the shape of it. Okay. Another great day. I'm Joe. And I'm Dirtman, bringing the geology to you.
from here in Sprakers, New York. And now back to you, Jerry. Okay, we'll continue on here. Thanks, Andrew. I know he went back. He had to go off and come back in again. So let me pick up where we left off down here. There we go. Okay. Brittany. Oops. All righty. Rockdrum is also sponsored by Crystal Cove Collective. Michael and Krista would love to see you drop by their shop in Lower Allen Shopping Center in Camp Hill. I've been there. They have a very big shop with a wide variety of items for you to look at and explore. And they're also in the Morning Sun Market in New York. Hey, don't forget, we're only a few weeks away now from our Zoom Rock Room gathering for the summer uh, out at Greenwood Furnace uh, State Park, Saturday, June 25th. If you're planning on going, uh, send me an email, which is on the invites that you all get every every uh, program we'll be meeting at uh, pavilion number six i will be sending out a a map and some other directions uh instructions uh shortly but uh but uh, we will have uh paul fagley who is recently retired from greenwood furnace will be our host he's not able to be with us tonight with another uh responsibility he, he's doing this week with the area carnival so anyway, if you plan on going to uh, our gathering, let us know. Uh, we will be supplying the uh, plates, utensils, hamburgers, hot dogs, rolls, and all the condiments. And we ask you to bring uh, a covered dish, and we'll give you a better number when we get uh, into about another week or so. Then we'll send out the invite and uh, all the details. Alrighty, don't forget to check out the James Webb Telescope, www.jwst.nasa.gov. And the first pictures from the telescope will be due back and seen on July 12th of this year. Everybody's going to be standing by the computer for that one, I guarantee you. Uh, Jones Geological Services, our, our program schedule. Uh, in two days, actually, June 9th, uh, if you're in the Hanover, Pennsylvania area, come over to the, uh, the Rumble Farm parking area, and we're going to have a, a tour a program about the Marianne Furnace. That's that uh, basically on the Rumble Farm, and we'll be showing you some artifacts and talking about the history. The oldest uh, coal burning uh, furnace west of the Susquehanna River, and that'll be on uh, this, this uh, Thursday at 9 o'clock. Uh, Day after our gathering in uh, Greenwood Furnace, uh, come to Columbia, Pennsylvania, and Lancaster County, and uh, we'll be doing a, about a two-mile hike along the Northwest Lancaster County Trail, and uh, we're talking about the geology and uh, the St. Charles Furnace. We will see uh, then. July 7th is a, a duplicate of the June 9th program with the uh, Marion Furnace, and then August the 5th. Uh, hopefully the weather cooperates. We're going to uh, take over the park at the uh, Smith Station Road boat launch area and do astronomy night. Uh, so um, we hope that some of you will show up for that. And join Jerry at the Experience Cadoris Outdoors Friday, June 17th and June 18th. There's going to be all sorts of fun activities. There's disc golfing down there, birding, geocaching. Um, Jerry's going to be taking care of the fossil dig. So go ahead and join him and check that out. And we are looking for some volunteers to stop by and help identify uh, fossils as the kids and adults will have a chance to uh, find. These are from up in Schuylkill County at my favorite uh, fossil site uh, in Schuylkill County at New Ringgold. 
Uh, rock room schedule. Uh, changed it a little bit since we last saw you. Uh, Joseph came to us and said he'd like to do a, another Jeopardy uh, game, which he had done with the room before. But in salute of the uh, James Webb, Webb Telescope and uh, some other exciting things that are happening up there, he's going to do an astronomy Jeopardy game, and uh, we'll be giving you some updates about the James Webb Telescope and uh, We'll put Brittany on her favorite uh, Mars project and find out what's new with the, uh, the rover going on up there. July 5th, the geology of your county. And July 19th, is the uh, we're going to talk about the Pennsylvania Heritage Geology Sites that you may have never heard of. That's a state-ran uh, program. And we're looking for presenters in August and into the future. So if you know of anybody or even if you want to do a program, uh, everybody qualifies, so uh, we'll be off and running there. So, yep. You know, since I last saw y'all, um, I tried, I, I actually signed up to do an exercise class to lose a little bit of weight, and they told me, make sure you wear loose clothing. I told them if I had any loose clothing, I wouldn't be registering for this program. But, uh, anyway, so, uh, all right. And we're going to move right into our presenter tonight, and uh, uh, we actually want to thank Andrew. He's back in the room, I believe, and uh, thank him for that excellent part two of uh, Andrew and Joe working at Herkimer. Andrew really has fallen in love with the Herkimer Diamond excursion, so uh, that's great. Okay, uh, as we normally do, if you're new to the room, uh, uh, questions will be answered after the program tonight, and we actually usually ask you to put the questions into the chat, uh, and Brittany will monitor those as, as they come up. Uh, so hold your questions to the end and all that. So we're actually honored tonight to have uh, somebody who I never heard speak before, although he belongs to the same speakers bureau as I'm in with the York Area Record. Uh, Bart Stump is a middle school social studies teacher and a freelance writer. He has uh, been published in numerous magazines and written about intriguing personalities, interesting locations, historical events, and parenting topics. And his, in his spare time, Bart enjoys reading, nature study, biking, kayaking, local history, genealogy, and treasure hunting. I really don't know when he has time to teach school, but uh, we want to welcome uh, Mr. Bart Stump, and he's going to talk about the uh, petroglyphs along the Susquehanna River. Bart, welcome. Hey, everybody. All right, let's see. There we go. So I'm a seventh grade history teacher, so I am used to interruptions. So if you actually have burning questions, feel free to throw them out there. And the irony of this is we are, are actually just kind of going through, um, we've been working our way up through some of the cultures in South and Central America and into North America. And we just did a lesson on the Algonquian Indians. And I'm like, hey, I know something about that. And I was able to tie the uh, petroglyph article into that. So I actually, uh, this is my third presentation now. I, I had two days worth of classes and now I'm able to share this with you. So thank you so much for inviting me. All right, I'm hoping my screen share is going to work and we'll get you right into this. All right, hopefully we are seeing a blue screen that says Native American petroglyphs. You're good. All right. Wow, I must have done this a while ago. So let me give you a little background on this. Um, one of the joys of teaching is we have to continuously stay updated with our uh, credit counts for education. And we're always looking for good summer workshops. And I was very fortunate in a couple of years back to do uh, a Susquehanna River course. And one of the things we were gonna do is we we're gonna go out and see the petroglyphs. And I had absolutely no idea what that was gonna entail or what was involved with that. And based on that, this got me very, very interested in this topic and uh, the rest has been history. So without further ado, here we go. So I like to start off, um, again, it's the teacher part of me. I like to break words down into their parts. So I always tell the kids, okay, break it apart. What do you think Petro means? What do you think glyph means? 
And they're pretty quick to figure out that glyphs would be like hieroglyphs. So they're like, okay, it's probably some sort of picture or some sort of symbol. Um, they struggle a little bit with the idea of Petra though. And we know that that is stone or rock. So a petroglyph by definition is a noun and typically it is referring to a rock carving and especially the historic ones. And what's interesting about this is if you throw out the word petroglyph, most people immediately think of the desert Southwest. There's national parks out there that are kind of you know all around there. And you don't typically think about them on the East Coast, and most people don't really think about them being in York County or the fact that, hey, the Susquehanna River actually has some of these. So that's where it starts to get interesting. So based on the evidence we have at this point in time, we do believe the petroglyphs that are found in this area do date back a thousand years. And I was quite proud of one of my kiddos the other day. He's like, well, how do we know that? And I was like, well, exactly. It's not like you can really carbon 14 date uh, material like that. So we were having a discussion how they have to go in and do an archeological dig. And based on um, the native villages in that area, they were able to basically get the idea that it's about a thousand years old, which makes it pretty impressive when you really think about it. Here's where I made my mistakes when I first started writing. Um, the petroglyphs were actually the first article I've ever had published and it was a very, very steep learning curve. And I have certainly made some adjustments and improvements along the way. So here's what we know. Um, Native Americans were very, shall we say, fluid, um, moving through different areas. And you know they would stay there, they might have another group come in and push them out, or they might go and conquer another area. So a lot of times, instead of looking at a specific tribe, they look at language groups. And in this case, it's the Algonquian speaking groups. Uh, and they're actually known as the Shanks Ferry people. When the archeologists came in to do their dig, they actually did that at a place called Shanks Ferry. Guess what? It was actually a ferry owned by a guy by the name of Shank. Uh, and that's how this all gets started. And in my infinite wisdom, when I first started this stuff, I did not know that there was a difference between Algonquin and Algonquian. It's one letter, that last A in there. Uh, and it's actually two different things. So I was kind of much embarrassed when I realized that and I was able to fix that then in subsequent articles. Uh, but then again, this is a large language group. They actually extend from uh, Maryland up through Pennsylvania, in some cases up into New England. Uh, so then a, a rather large group that were all kind of speaking the same dialect there. So obviously they did not refer to themselves as the Shanks Ferry people. That's just a term that we use for people to get a reference for where they were located. All right, so what's gonna happen is if you wanna see these, you're gonna either need to have a boat or a canoe or a kayak, or you're going to get very, very wet. Um, they are literally located out in the middle of the Susquehanna River. So it's pretty much water only access. And what I have here is an aerial view looking down. This is the Safe Harbor Dam. And you can see there's a bunch of islands out there and you are trying to find several specific ones that have the petroglyphs on them. And the first time you're there, that can be a little bit intimidating trying to figure this out. And there's two potential ways that you can get to the site. And the easiest, if you have a canoe or a kayak, is to come down the Conestoga River, which is right at the top part of the photo there. Uh, you can kind of see where it says Powerhouse Road. That's actually the Conestoga River coming in. It's more of a creek at that point. Um, but that is very, very easy access. If you are paddling, you have approximately a half mile downstream paddle. If you are going to have a power boat, you would need to launch at the Pequay Boat Launch, which is about two miles downstream from there. Um, I've made the mistake of paddling up twice. I will never do that again because you are paddling against the current. Um, I will always be coming out from the Conestoga. It's way, way easier. Oh, and there we go. That's what I was talking about. So what is interesting, uh, because it is literally right below a hydroelectric dam, one of the things you have to be concerned about is if they're actually releasing water, if they're generating electrical power. I've never actually been there when there's been a water release, but I have been told that it gets very, very turbulent in there. So if you were interested in going to see this and you start hearing sirens and seeing flashing lights on the dam, that is your clue to get out of town very, very quickly. Uh, I have been told it creates, I don't wanna go out and say whirlpools, but I've been told that it makes some pretty strong eddies that you really don't wanna be in there. And we have been there under varying, varying conditions. We've been there sometimes where it's been smooth as glass and you could easily just paddle across the surface. And there's been other times where there was a really, really strong current that you had a, it, it was a good workout trying to cut across and get to where we wanted to go. So again, if you're paddling, you wanna come in from the Conestoga River, there's a beautiful park located in there. Uh, the parking's right along the water. You just carry your boats down, you hop in, you're good to go. 
uh, the Peckway boat launch, if you have a power boat, about two miles downstream. All right. Your main goal that you are looking for, and they are very appropriately named, are Big Indian Rock and Little Indian Rock. And I like to use uh, the smaller photo here as a comparison. That's my sister in her kayak, and she's using a nine foot kayak. So Little Indian Rock is uh, roughly 20 feet long. Um, Big Indian Rock, I'm gonna guess somewhere in maybe the 75 to 80 foot range. These are the two that are the easiest to find. There are several other islands out there that have petroglyphs as well, um, but these are the big two that you typically see on social media and everything else, um, simply because Big Indian Rock is the largest chunk out there, it's kind of hard to miss. If you're interested in going to see these things, your absolute best time to go is either near sunrise or sunset. And the reason being is very simple. The steeper the angle of the sun coming in, it actually has a tendency to shadow along the edge and it makes the glyphs look much more, much more visibly appealing. It's gonna really pop it out for you. Um, first time we went there, we were there around lunchtime and we were almost standing on glyphs and we had no idea. We couldn't even see them and they were literally right in front of us. So this was one of my old teaching partners. This is Mike and I took him down there and he's standing on Little Indian Rock and we were close to sunset that evening. And if you take a look there, there's a lot of activity going on on this island. It's to the point where it's almost hard to step on this side of the island and not actually end up stepping on one of the petroglyphs. There's just so much action going on there. And I think that's the fascinating part. Like you can just keep exploring and exploring and exploring. You keep finding more and more and more. And it's just really, really cool. Some of the tricks we've learned along the way to make them much more visible. Um, one of the easy tricks to do is you take along an empty milk jug and a sponge. And if you kind of make the sponge damp and stamp around that, that really, really helps kind of make them pop out. It makes them much, much more visible. Sometimes it's easier though, just to pour water directly on them. And again, that'll make them much more visible. One of the things that they used to do back in the day, people actually came in and painted on them or they would use chalk to kind of fill them in. Um, that is seriously frowned upon. Um, it's stone and yeah, you technically can't really, really hurt it a lot doing that, but that's not the point. Um, you know, these are ancient Native American petroglyphs. They should be respected. So either stamping around them or just pouring water on them um, is a much, much better way to see them than chalking them or, oh, God forbid, please do not paint them. All right, if you were paddling downstream, so if you were coming out the Conestoga River, you would put the Safe Harbor Dam behind you. And the easiest thing I can say is look for the biggest chunk of rock downstream. And it is described as a uh, very smooth surface. It's kind of sloping down towards the upstream side, not a lot of vegetation on it. Now, I will warn you that the water levels do fluctuate quite a bit depending when you go and visit. Uh, the last time we were there, I was very, very surprised to find not just debris, but an entire dead tree about 30 feet up on the island. So you can imagine the amount of water that had to be coming down through there to deposit a tree up on top of that. But that is your main goal, and that's where we'll get started. Big Indian Rock. Now, what makes me laugh is we're talking about ancient carvings that are almost a thousand years old. There are some more, shall we say, recent ones. Um, this one's probably dating from somewhere in the 1800s. Hey, thousand years, 1800s, that's relatively recent. And what we're looking at here is an example of Pennsylvania Dutch folk art called Fractor. And doves are very much used in their symbolism. And this guy is really hard to miss. It is very, very large, probably about three feet across, located smack on top of the island. Uh, so obviously, as the Europeans came in, they were inspired by some of the activities the Native Americans were doing as well. So this is on top of Big Indian Rock, and there's not a ton of uh, petroglyphs on this rock, but the ones that are there are kind of cool. And what we see happening is a lot of these things are anthropomorphic, meaning they're part animal, they're part human, or they're shamans. They're showing us um, religious figures. They're priest. So if you look at the one on the right, it uh, looks like a head with maybe two antenna, and then I see two limbs, two limbs, and wait, another two limbs. Most of us don't have six arms and legs, so that's where we're getting into this combination of animal and human things here. Uh, then you can see a guy that's kind of upside down there. I call him the alien man. We'll come back to him in a minute, and if you look to the upper left, you can see what we call an eagle man. And when I first did the articles, I was under the assumption these were Thunderbirds, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, subsequent 
uh, presentations now has me understanding that this is an eagle man. And the idea is that bald eagles were a sacred animal to a lot of the Native American tribes. And what would happen is the shamans would actually dress up as eagles. So they might have a cloak that would go over their arms that actually had feathers dangling down and they would use that to portray um, the idea of the bald eagle. So we definitely think these sites have something to do with their religious practices back in the day, which is just one of the things that just makes them so fascinating. All right, close-up views of some of the other petroglyphs here on Big Indian Rock. I always like the one on the left. Um, I typically can't say I've seen someone that has a pyramid-shaped head, and if you can bend your legs like that, you might want to get some medical help. That's probably not a good thing. Looking at the one on the right, I always tell, tell the students that this is our alien, and you can clearly see the head, and then it looks like two antennas sticking out. Um, this, think about this. Native Americans typically wore some sort of feather headdress, and again, a shaman is a high-ranking person. He's the priest. Um, there's a very good chance that he is going to have two feathers on his headdress, and that's what's going on there. He's not some alien that has come down to make images in rock. So the first time I was there, we simply stopped at Big Indian Rock, and I'm being interrupted by a giant schnauzer, schnauzer who is trying to get a treat from me. She has perfect timing here. Um, so they kept talking about Little Indian Rock, and they never really told us where it was at. So when my sister and I went to find it, we're like, okay, you know, we're going to just poke around till we do this. So we found Big Indian Rock, no problem. Again, you can't miss it. And we kind of basically got back in the boats and started paddling upstream roughly 100 yards and dumb luck I just happened to look over my shoulder and we saw this guy on the side of the rock and we had found little Indian rock. So the challenge here is again depending on what the water levels are. Um, we've had it anywhere between eight feet higher eight feet lower. So there are some glyphs on the side and again it's going to depend on the water levels. They might, might be visible they might not. So this guy he goes for a swim quite often. The beauty of Little Indian Rock is it is literally the largest concentration of petroglyphs anywhere in the entire Northeast. I'll let that sink in a second. So again, they're very, very well known in the desert Southwest, but in the Northeast, um, they're a little bit on the rare side. So to have this many glyphs literally located on one spot is absolutely amazing. So these are the big two. Um, there are several other islands out there as well. And it's actually going to be my summer project. Uh, we'd like to go down and try to find some of the other ones. So if you just kind of take a look at the picture, there is a lot going on. You can see an inverted human figure. I see some wavy serpent lines, a very large sun thunderbird there. There's various animal tracks. Um, unfortunately, there is some more modern graffiti there. I think it was a member of the US military from 1917, uh, left his mark there as well. But there's just some really, really cool stuff to see there. If you're along the side, you will start noticing various animals. And again, the question is why? What are they trying to show us? Um, is this an indication of the wildlife that's in the area? Is it possibly a map pointing out potentially good hunting areas? Um, I've always interpreted the bird there as possibly a turkey, um, the critter beside it, maybe a coyote, maybe a wolf. Um, the thing with the very long tail, we go back far enough, there were panthers and cougars in Pennsylvania, so maybe that's what they're showing us there. When you get up top, one of the really cool things that you find are a variety of different tracks. So they have turkey track, you will find life-size deer and elk tracks, there's bear prints, and there's actually a human footprint. And what is so cool about this is it almost looks like the animal just walked through wet clay and it just froze there. And we know that's not the case. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what type of rock the islands are made out of, but we do know that it is very, very hard. Um, some people have suggested that this might just be graffiti. There's no way. There was a concerted effort involved in doing this and chiseling this in by hand. So they put a lot of effort into this. So whatever they were trying to tell us was very, very important. And I kind of pointed that out to my students, you know, these ideas have been around for a thousand years. They wanted us to understand what was going on here. So again, there is some conjecture. If you follow the turkey tracks, is that a map indicating a potential hunting area? Maybe it's another village. What's going on with that? So what really is very elusive about this is there was no written language, the Algonquians. So a lot of it's just oral traditions. And unfortunately, some of that was lost over time. So a lot of this is kind of speculation, just trying to understand what were they trying to tell us here? And we're not 100% sure. 
One of the intriguing glyphs here is actually a petroglyph within petroglyphs. And we call this one the medicine wheel. And again, there's a variety of smaller glyphs inside of that. And this is my sister. And she, again, was using a wet sponge and kind of stamping around that. And you can see how that literally just kind of pops off the surface. But again, we don't know what they're trying to tell us, but it's really cool to see. All right, I have mentioned the Thunderbird several times, so I should definitely come back to that. Many, many Native American societies revered the Thunderbird. Um, a lot of times it is a force of good. It was considered to be a giant bird, like an eagle, and supposedly when it would clap its wings, that's what would produce thunder, and then it could then shoot lightning, I've heard, either out of its eyes or out of its beak. So the idea is this creature is flying overhead. It's kind of watching out for the people. Um, you see this a lot in you know, the totem poles out in the Pacific Northwest. You see it in some of the tribes come across the Great Plains. Definitely see it here in the Northeast. So this is one of the symbols that really have tremendous meaning to them. So it's kind of interesting to find that here, literally on a rock right in the middle of the Susquehanna River. One of the other things that I should point out is um, I was at a presentation one time and it was right around the time I was teaching my unit on ancient Egypt. And they were mentioning how there were just dots on the top of the island and immediately a light bulb went off in my head. And I'm like, um, is this a constellation? And the answer was yes. And why I was thinking about that is if you look at the placement of the pyramids in Egypt, they are lined up with Orion's belt. They created heaven here on earth. And the Native Americans here were doing the exact same thing. So some of the dots actually do represent star patterns that they would see above them, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. This critter is one of the more elusive ones, and that's me with a very uneven tan. Uh, and this critter is known as the Manito. Now, this one's a challenge. Depending on what sources you go to, they do consider it to be a godlike being. Um, some sources said it's a force of good, some forces said it's a, you know, a source of evil, other ones are just it's a natural spirit that's out there. So this is the one that really kind of fascinates me and basically it has kind of a rounded head, you can see the pointy beak, it actually does have two antennas, and then these very um, wavy curvy lines that kind of go down around the body. Um, I will also point out that the photos are very misleading. If I would have been about six more inches to my right, I conveniently would have been taking a swim because I would have rolled right off the island. And my sister, being the nervous Nellie that she is, was constantly, you know, be careful, be careful, be careful. And I said, my biggest concern is if I go in, make sure you catch the camera when I throw it to you. Um, but you do need to take some caution there. Uh, you know, you are on an island in the river. If you're not paying attention, you do get to go for a nice little pleasant swim. Uh, another thing I like to point out is make sure you tie your boats off um, because, again, the current can be rather strong there. And if you don't want to go for a swim after your boats, make sure you have them securely tied. We only made that mistake once. One of the absolute coolest aspects here are the serpent lines. And there are several different lines here. They obviously resemble a snake. That's why they're called the serpent lines. And this is where we get into the idea that some of these glyphs are actually part of a calendar system. Uh, some of these actually mark the position of either sunrise or sunset on the solstices. And I always like to explain to the kids that the solstices are either the longest amount, uh, the day with the longest amount of sunlight or the day with the most, the shortest amount of sunlight. And all ancient civilizations around the world were aware of this and they actually marked that out. And I was at a presentation one time where they showed us a video. They actually had gone out there on the morning of uh, the solstice. And they had the camera kind of focusing on one of the serpent lines. And you could see it getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And finally, a sunbeam as it crested the hill came down smack dab right on top of this carving. And it literally just gave me chills. So the idea that you know the Native Americans living here in our backyard were using this as a calendar system to mark one of the most significant dates to them just absolutely blows my mind. I just thought that was incredibly cool. So it kind of comes down to what is this all about? Is it art? Is it religious? Is it a map? Is it a calendar system? Is it all of these things? So again, if you take a look at this picture here, you can see so much going on. I'm looking at elk tracks. I see a, an anthropomorphic human image there. I see the uh, Manito. There's some Thunderbirds in there. This island is just literally crawling with carvings what were they trying to tell us? You know, they made this a permanent mark. Obviously, it had incredible importance to them. 
what's it all about? And I think that's what makes this so absolutely intriguing. Um, I know people just go back time and time again just to look at it and just kind of sit there and ponder what they're trying to tell us. So I kind of go there with the Manitou then, focusing on the religious capabilities. So I've, I've gone down here with various people. A lot of times they're uh, co-workers with their families. So this was actually the son of my old language arts partner. And I just like the view. It kind of shows him down in his kayak and you can just see all the petroglyphs kind of laid out in front on top of the island. And again, there's just literally so much going on. Uh, it is actually suggested that if you are on the island to remove your shoes, you're better off just walking barefoot. Again, not that we can per se necessarily damage them, but it's the idea we want them to last another thousand years. So one of the things that we found very interesting, the last time I was down there, I was with my partner, Mike, from a school, and we were determined to find some of the other smaller islands that had some other petroglyphs on it. And of course, me being me, I forgot to look at my notes that day that kind of gave me an idea where they were at, and we completely went the wrong direction. And I ended up working my way almost the whole way over to the Lancaster shore of the river, and I glimpsed like straight lines. And we know Mother Nature, that's just something that's not real normal. So this caught my attention and I got out of the boat and I walked up and we found this guy and we affectionately nicknamed him the gingerbread man. And I was really kind of surprised. It was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. I was starting to question, is this actually Native American? Is this something that, you know, was more modern? Somebody just did it as graffiti. We really weren't sure. So we snapped a bunch of photos and here you can see another image of it. And um, I sent them to Paul Nevin. If you ever get the opportunity to hear Paul Nevin speak, you got to go. He is absolutely amazing. He is the regional expert on the petroglyphs. Um, college professors go to him. Like He is the source, and I used to actually work with his wife, Amy, so that was kind of cool. So we sent him these photos saying, hey, Paul, I'm sure you know about this. I found this. You know, I was just curious. Did you think, you know, this is Native American? You think it's more modern, whatever? And I was blown away when he responded back, we've never seen this one before. It's undocumented. And they had actually gone to most of the islands out there finding the petroglyphs and um, GPS marking them. So the fact that Mike and I found an undocumented one just blew my mind and just proves that there is always something out there to be discovered. Um, which just makes it even more intriguing. So I am dying for school to end. Uh, I am down at Pikesville, Maryland right now. We have to go till next Thursday. It's torture. Um, so I have plans, you know, to hit the river this summer. We want to get out there. We want to try to find some of the other islands, look at some of the other petroglyphs and you know, maybe even discover some new ones. So that would be really, really cool. All right. So that's my slideshow. So I'm going to stop that and I'll bring it back. Questions? Yeah, great. Yeah. So, how I'm I'm just curious. How come it's much more dangerous to paddle or canoe uphill as opposed to downhill? It's not so much that it's dangerous. I'm just lazy. Um, <laughs> and when we did the workshops the first time, uh, those that were experienced, we got to paddle them in the canoes. Um, and two miles gets really long when you're uh, not quite in shape the way you should be. It's just way, way easier to come downstream. Why is it easier to come downstream as opposed to upstream? You're not fighting the current. <laughs> just real simple. You're just not fighting the current and it's a lot shorter. Um. You sound like my students when they just sit there and stare at me. <laughs> No, I was like, what could be dangerous? Because you said something yeah. could be dangerous. When they are releasing water, that would be the only thing that would be dangerous. Uh, if the sirens go off and the lights are going off, you do not want to be there at that time. That's the danger part. And I've never experienced it. And I don't think I want to. Let's keep our fingers crossed that we don't have to. <laughs> you guys are making this entirely too easy on me. I did go out on the, on the river with Paul and Evan one time to... He wanted to show me the two rocks because of the, he had a theory that they were two different rock types. And uh, he took me, he, he took me out there one day to, for me to investigate that and they are the same rock called a, called a, a mica schist. Oh, uh, how are they dated? So again, we can't necessarily date the rocks themselves. And the date they came up with was based on the archaeological dig that they did in the area of Shanks Ferry. 
Um, so based on the artifacts that they covered there, they were able to determine that they're about a thousand years old. Oh, the river levels have fluctuated significantly. Um, because of the dams now, we think the water levels are close to at least 30 feet higher than they were once upon a time. So these guys would have been relatively far up in the air. Um, and what's interesting is some of the conjecture is because uh, the American shad was a migratory species, these would have definitely been a fishing location. Um, that would have been a major source of food for them. And there's some connections with the Native Americans. They are looking at um, the sky above, the underworld, and then the world around them. And what is interesting is there's actually, um, if the, the water level would be lower, the one island, there's actually a passageway. You can almost go the whole way through it. And the other one has a very large opening on the side. And there's connections there with the underworld. Plus the fact, just think about it. If you're out in the middle of the river, just looking up, you've got the entire sky above you. It would be absolutely amazing. Anybody else? Uh, how did they I actually say? carve the rock? So what we think they did is they actually just used rock, other rocks to carve it in. And again, um, as hard as it is, this would have been a significant undertaking. They didn't just go out there and just scrape it in. They had to actually go out there and put some effort into it. Is, is this where I dropped the pop quiz on you guys? <laughs> um, did they have mold? We think they just freehanded it, as best we know. How were they dated? Uh, again, based on the archaeological dig at the village that's nearby, that's how they kind of, they're assuming that was the group that did it. How long do you think it took them to uh, carve a petroglyph? Oh my gosh, um, I'm trying to think. I know Paul talked about that in one of his presentations. Jerry, you might be able to answer this better than me. I mean, based on how hard that was, and they're about what, maybe a quarter inch deep into the surface? Quarter, half inch. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna take some effort and some time to do it. It was, it was more than one or two days, I'm sure. I never heard Paul say that, so. Do you have a it, oh gosh I don't it, know is it hard to uh, to um, tie up your canoe uh, against those rocks it really depends on the water levels big Indian rocks actually very simple if you go to the downstream side it's almost like natural steps in the rocks you can almost pull your boat right into it and then you just okay. kind of walk up through there little Indian rock it really it's kind of a crapshoot um, you know it depends when you get there there's various footholds that you can get on different sides. Um, okay. We've always been able to just kind of pop up. And you got to do a little finagling, but it's not hard. Yeah, you can okay. easily get up there. All right, uh, thank you. Still Native Americans in the area. So that's one of the big challenges. Um, I know with Paul's research, he was actually contacting Native Americans that are now living up in Canada. Um, they were from that Algonquin language group. Again, just trying to compare their symbols with what we're finding down here, just trying to find you know the meaning behind it. And so unfortunately, we really don't know of any local groups around here that still would have had a connection to that. Do you know of a printed source that's available? Oh, um, there is an excellent book put out by the Pennsylvania Historical um, or Museum and Historical Commission. And it was done by, I'm thinking it was Cadwell, or or something like that. Um, he did the major research back, I think it was in the 20s and 30s. And speaking to that was kind of neat because they knew the river levels were coming up. They actually took what was called Wanted Island. They actually jackhammered the petroglyphs out. They are now on display in the State Museum in Harrisburg um, at, oh, I'm going to lose the name here. There's another small historical society close to, it's the back way to Millersville. All I could think of is the tomato farm. Um, they have some petroglyphs there as well. So there are a couple places that you can go and see them if you don't feel like going out in the river. Anything else? I'll turn it back to you, Jerry, unless there's any other questions. All right, any other questions before we move on and close out here? Excellent program. That was great. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks for having me.
It was super interesting. Thank you very much. You guys were a much better audience than my students. <laughs> <laughs> they're checking out for the year. I think they're about done. Yeah, I'm just reading the comments here that uh, Dwayne says about accessing it from the York County side. Yeah, Otter Creek. Uh, so yeah, okay. Are there, are there still Native Americans in the area who knew something about the uh, petroglyphs? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, okay. And for future reference, where, where would this be located? The, the Susquehanna River thing, where, where would this be located? So the petroglyphs are right below the Safe Harbor Dam. So it's smack dab right in between York and Lancaster counties. Um, if you go online and put in the Conestoga Park, you'll easily find how to get there. And if you have canoes or kayaks, that's just the easiest way. You can just put in right there and stop, skip, and jump down. Nice. And Kathleen's from uh, New Jersey, so gotcha. she's, a, she's an Alice Theater. Yeah. That's the big question. Are there other ones underwater? Um, Wouldn't I love to know? So uh, I think if, I'm hoping maybe they announce when they're going to have kind of drawdowns, and that's definitely when we're going to be hitting it, hoping to see more of the rock exposed and hopefully find some more petroglyphs while we're out there. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, Bart, for being with us, and I'm sure your uh, your your students get a great education. With your your knowledge and no, scuba driver personality, <laughs> we like to have fun. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, maybe sometime you and I can meet uh, in person and uh, just uh, shoot the breeze back and forth a little bit between petroglyphs and 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 rocks. So, all right, thank you, Bart, again. All right, as I mentioned earlier, my wife. Uh, Retired from ministry 39 and three quarter years ago. Well, uh, no, she served in ministry three, 39 and three quarter years, and uh, and she was ready for retirement. So, uh, a story I told in the church service, I think you might appreciate this as an ending. Was it was uh, uh, one? It's a joke, really. But uh, uh, as the as the choir was gathering for choir practice during the week. This uh, elderly man came walking into the church. Uh, he really didn't understand how he could walk. He looked so frail and and uh, just in sad shape. Bent over, walking with a, with a cane. And we watched him go into the minister's office. And ten minutes later, he came back out of the office, and he was walking upright, looking really good. And we said. He said, wow, the minister must have really healed him. He's now walking upright. When when Luann came out of the office to choir practice, we asked her, did you heal that man? And she said, no, I just gave him a, a longer cane. So anyway, all right, well, exciting night. Uh, I do want to let you know uh, if you're going to try to find this video, you won't see it for probably a few weeks. Uh, jonesgeo.com is being rebuilt and uh and we'll have a new look to it but uh, we will have a we will have a, a jerry and Brittany uh youtube channel where all these videos will be uh, easily found when we're up and running so you may not see the uh, video but it obviously has been done and will be posted when we get the uh the uh website uh up and running there so just be patient with us. We have somebody new working with us that uh, is going to make a real, make it look really dazzling. So, uh, so all the old ones are, are down too, right? Yeah. We're all going to switch all to the YouTube channel. Yeah, you can still go to a Jones Geo to the Zoom Rock Room. Okay. Link and thank you and see the ones that have been posted. Uh, but the the newer ones are going to be missing for a, a few weeks. Anyway, all right. So, okay, uh, Brittany, you want to take us out of here? Yeah, it sounds like you're going to ruin my plan to stay hidden from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. And I hope everybody has a good two weeks, and we'll see you on the 21st.
Okay, we'll see you all. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.